Hi everyone and welcome back. So this semester we are just finishing up some of the normal anatomy and physiology and sonographic evaluation of our small parts. Now when we talk about small parts, it's a kind of like a subcategory of your abdomen registry. So anytime you go to sit for your abdomen boards, it's going to say abdomen and small part sonography. It's all kind of lumped in together, even though these organs and these exams are obviously not in the abdominal cavity. So when we say small parts, we are talking about thyroid, parathyroid. We're also talking about scrotum and all of the scrotal contents. We also talk about adrenal glands, which we'll get to at the end of the semester, um, and normal and abnormal looking lymph nodes, which we'll kind of touch upon when we learn about um, the thyroid. So these first few weeks, we're still going to be continuing on with pretty much this new information. And then once we finish our scrotal PowerPoints, we are then going to kind of backtrack into our um, abdominal pathology. So with this, we are going to start with our thyroid first. So just some basic anatomy about the thyroid. The thyroid in particular is going to vary quite a bit uh, between patients. We see a lot of abnormalities. We see a lot of pathology when it comes to the thyroid. So it's really important for us to learn what is normal um, in terms of function and in terms of appearance. So the location of the standard thyroid is going to be located in the anterior neck. Uh, it's going to be slightly lateral to the trachea. So our Thyroid gland itself is butterfly in shape, meaning we kind of have these two wings on the sides, and then we have this little band of tissue, which we're going to learn about that connects the two. That band of tissue, what we call our isthmus, that's going to travel directly anterior to our trachea or our throat. Now our uh, lobes, our right and left lobe, our little butterfly wings, those are going to band out along the lateral aspects. We are also going to see the thyroid located slightly inferior to the thyroid cartilage. And we also see it medial to the internal jugular vein and the common carotid arteries. Now the common carotid artery, that is that main artery that runs up your neck to feed your brain. We're gonna talk about that when we get to vasculature in a little bit. And then our IJV, our uh, internal jugular vein, that is going to be draining our venous blood from our head back down into our heart. So we have two major vessels that are running right alongside that thyroid. We're going to use them as landmarks to help us navigate while we're scanning. We do have some variants that we have to talk about. Now, this is not something that we see all too often if we are seeing a thyroid variant, but we can have what's called a pi, I'm having a rough time today per usual, uh, pyramidal lobe. And this is kind of just a little piece of accessory thyroid tissue that kind of travels up superiorly from the thyroid particularly from the isthmus region. So that isthmus, that's that bridge between the two butterfly wings that goes directly in front of our throat. This little piece of uh, thyroid tissue is going to kind of originate from that region and travel up towards the patient's chin. This is also known as a third lobe and it can occur in up to 30% of the population. So we're, although it's, you know, a pretty significant percentage. We're not actually seeing these variants uh, super obviously on ultrasound. Usually this little piece of thyroid tissue is super small um, if we are even seeing it at all. So if we look at our diagram here, just kind of outlining our thyroid, we have our right lobe connecting to our left lobe by our isthmus. All right, and here we are at the superior aspect of our isthmus. We have this little sliver of thyroid tissue that's kind of creeping upward. This is also a good uh, image. As I said, we're going to get back to the vascularity, but this is also a good image showing the relationship between the thyroid and the two major vessels, our carotid and our jugular. So our carotid is going to be um, a main arterial supply from the heart directly up to the brain and that is going to be traveling right laterally and left laterally to our thyroid tissue and then running opposite direction but side by side with that carotid is going to be that jugular vein that's draining the head and traveling back down into the heart so that's going to be this vessel I should have done opposite colors for those. <laughs> Just realized that. 
training back, SVC, back to the heart. So some size and composition, that should say composition, uh, information on the thyroid itself. The thyroid tissue is going to be composed of these really functional cells. So our thyroid, when we get into the physiology of it, has so many different purposes and so many different functions. And these cells are constantly working. So the tissue itself is going to be made up of follicular cells and parafollicular cells. We will get into that a little bit further. Now, because of the makeup of the thyroid, how we have all of these different functional cells that are carrying out all of the the purposes of the thyroid, it's going to have a slightly lobular appearance to it. The size can vary to it. Echogenicity is going to vary a little bit as well. Um, so it's not going to look the same between every single patient or within a certain gender or a certain age range. So we do have a lot of variety and variability in terms of normal when it comes to the thyroid. So the gland is going to be considered enlarged when we have particular measurements of measuring larger than they should be. So our length of the thyroid in adults can be up to six centimeters in size. Anything that is larger than that is going to kind of make us question, hey, is there something else going on? And when we talk about our thyroid pathologies and we talk about a lot of inflammatory conditions, that's when we're going to start to see those measurements coming in bigger than six centimeters in length. Now, our AP measurement, this is going to tell us if that gland is truly, in fact, enlarged and maybe not just long for that patient. So our AP measurement, if we see that, measuring five centimeters and up, we know that that gland is truly in fact enlarged. So AP measurement, two to three centimeters. And then our width is a little bit more variable. We're not really depending on the width too much. We can have that up to two centimeters wide. We will talk about how we should be measuring the thyroid gland and the thyroid tissue. So just bear with me on that. Now, obviously, anytime we're talking about a, a child or, um, uh, a younger patient, those measurements are going to be smaller in terms of our normal range. We need to be aware of our surrounding structures. Now this goes with anything that we're scanning, but when we're talking about the thyroid, there's a lot that's going on in your neck. We have all sorts of muscles, ligaments, vessels. We have a trachea, an esophagus. We have all of these things going on in such a small space. And it's very easy for us to get those different structures confused. So we need to have a basic understanding of some of the major structures that we could potentially be seeing while we're scanning and some of the structures that we're going to be using to help us navigate the thyroid in terms of landmarks. So we have these anterior structures, these major muscles that run in the anterior portion of our neck. We have our sternohyoid, our sternothyroid, and our omohyoid. We have really great examples of what these muscles are going to look like in our next few pictures. We also have kind of uh, to the sides of those three major strap muscles, we have what's called the sternocleidomastoid muscles. And you've probably heard about that in your anatomy class. That's that big, big muscle that runs along the front side aspect of our neck. Now, laterally, again, to the thyroid itself, we're going to have that common carotid artery, that major artery that's supplying our brain. And then we're going to have our internal jugular vein, which is draining our brain back down. Posterior to the thyroid, we are going to find our parathyroid glands, and we're going to talk about those in a moment as well. And also behind and to the sides of the thyroid, we are going to have our longest collie muscle on each side. And medially to the thyroid, we are going to see the trachea and the esophagus. Now, the esophagus runs to the left of the trachea. So when we are doing images of our uh, thyroid, we see our trachea and we oftentimes confuse it as a mass. So we will get to that when we get into our image evaluation as well. So let's take a look at some of our diagrams here. Here we have a cross section picture of if we were to take somebody's neck and kind of slice it and look down from it. We have the anterior aspect of the patient here and here we have their spine. So we know that this is going to be the posterior aspect there. Now here, right in the middle of our neck is our trachea or our windpipe if we're being less medical. Uh, let's see where we have our esophagus diagram here. 
Now, our esophagus in this diagram it is appearing as if it runs directly posterior to the trachea, but it truly does run to the left of the trachea. So we are going to expect to see it kind of slightly in this region here. Now here we have our right thyroid lobe, left thyroid lobe, both connected by our bridge, our isthmus. So that's kind of our general overview, right? We also have our jugular vein on each side running right next to our carotid artery on both sides. Now, if we look at the muscles, this is a really great diagram of the relationship of all of these crazy neck muscles going on. Here we have this, I'm gonna change my color one second. Here we have these really big sternocleidomastoid muscles. And if you know anyone who has like a really strong neck or like a bodybuilder, these muscles are like very prominent on them. And these we can often see on the patient. Now we have those three anterior strap muscles, those um, major muscles in the front of our neck. We have our sternohyoid here. This is gonna be one of the more anterior out of the three. We have kind of behind that, a little bit closer to our thyroid, we have our sternohyoid, excuse me, sternothyroid. And then kind of sandwiched between the two, we have our omohyoid and a little bit smaller than the other two. So again, on this side, we have sternohyoid, sternothyroid, closer to the thyroid, so that kind of helps you remember it. And then we have omohyoid sandwiched between the two other strap muscles and also sandwiched between the sternocleidomastoid and the sternothyroid uh, muscle as well. So there are additional muscles in the neck. We don't particularly need to get into that. Um, we don't really need to go too in depth with all of the musculature of the neck. These are just going to be our major muscles that we need to be aware of. And again, we have another nice diagram here, kind of showing now a uh, sagittal view of what those neck muscles look like and how they kind of fold and encase that thyroid. So we can see on this left side of the picture that those anterior strap muscles really are kind of protecting that thyroid tissue. They're really kind of running um, directly in front of it, directly anterior to it. This is also a nice diagram because it is showing us one of those uh, pyramidal lobes right here, kind of coming right off of that isthmus traveling superior to the patient's chin. Um, so this is just another great representation of what those major strap muscles look like in addition to that large sternocleidomastoid muscle running right anterior to the thyroid. Now here we have a diagram of our parathyroid glands. Now the parathyroids, we are going to talk about a little bit further, but they sit posterior and in different regions of that thyroid tissue. So this is kind of just showing us a back view of the thyroid. So if we were looking from the back side of the patient forward, we have the patient's esophagus here coming posterior. So remember all these posterior structures moving forward. We have our esophagus first, then we have our trachea, and then we don't see the isthmus, right? Because the isthmus is going to run around the front of the trachea to connect the two. So we're looking at the back side of each lobe of that thyroid. And that is where our parathyroid glands are going to be situated. And we will talk about those. I know I've said it a few times, but we will get there. So just bear with me. All right, let's talk about our vascularity. So what is supplying the thyroid and how is this thyroid draining? We are going to learn quite a bit about the um, aortic arch from here on out. In the previous semester, when we learned about abdominal contents and we learned about the aorta, we kind of just talked about it in terms of how we see it in the abdomen. But it's really important that we are aware of a lot of branching that occurs uh, much more superiorly right off of the heart. So as soon as that, that aorta is exiting the heart, it's going to kind of candy cane over and form this arch. On that arch, we are going to have these three major branches that come off it. 
Now, when we learn about how we scan carotids and uh, arterial arms and things like that, we're going to come back to this. But for now, we have to know that off of that aortic arch, our first branch is going to be what we call our innominant, our right innominant or our right brachiocephalic artery. Our second branch is going to be our left carotid artery or common carotid artery. And then our third branch is going to be our left subclavian artery. Now, with this, I'm going to get my little pencil here. We have our first branch here, second branch here, third branch here. Now, on the right side, you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute, how come the left carotid and the left subclavian each have their own branch off of the aortic arch, but the right side doesn't? It's just the way the body is formed. So on the right side, our very first branch is that brachiocephalic. So from there, it's going to split into our right subclavian and our right common carotid artery. So if we follow that brachiocephalic or that right-sided innominant artery up, we have our subclavian artery here, and then we have our right common carotid artery here. So the right side is always going to be a little bit different. The right side always is that first branch off of the aorta, and it comes from the joint union of the brachiocephalic or the innominant. Brachiocephalic and innominant are the same on the right side. It's interchangeable terminology. So as we follow these branches up to the brain, because as we know, that's where our carotids go, we're going to have kind of like these little sub branches coming off them, right? So we are going to have a branch off of the carotid itself is going to go to supply that thyroid tissue. So we have our superior thyroid artery. This is going to be a branch of the ECA. Now, bear with me, we're getting into a lot of vascular here, but our ECA is a branch off of our carotid further up closer to the brain. So let's follow this diagram up a little bit higher here. I have to get my drawing thing off so I can make sure I'm looking in the right region. Okay, so let's look at our right common carotid, right? So our first branch, we have our brachiocephalic, and then on the right side, that right common carotid is going to split. So we're following it, following it, following it, going all the way up, and then we get to a point where our common carotid artery splits, and it turns into the either internal carotid artery or the external carotid artery. Now, the external carotid artery one of the branches that comes off of that is going to be our superior thyroid artery. And it's going to kind of branch down and kind of travel backwards back down the patient's neck until it gets to that superior portion of that thyroid tissue. So the diagram is a pretty good representation of what that branching looks like. Now we also have our inferior thyroid artery. This is going to be a little bit different. This is going to be a branch of the thyrocervical trunk and it's actually going to travel upward to supply the inferior half of the thyroid. So the thyrocervical trunk is going to Sorry, just lost my audio. So the thyrocervical trunk is going to come off of our subclavian artery. So remember, on the right side, the subclavian is coming from the brachiocephalic trunk. And on the left side, the subclavian artery is coming directly off of that aortic arch. So here on the right side, we have our thyrocervical trunk coming right off of that subclavian artery. And same thing here on the left side. Now, these are going to travel upwards towards the inferior portion of that thyroid tissue. So the top half of the thyroid is getting supply from the superior thyroid artery, and then the bottom half of the thyroid is getting supply from the inferior thyroid artery. Now, the superior thyroid artery is coming off of the ECA, the external carotid artery, and the inferior thyroid artery is coming off of the thyrocervical trunk, which is a branch of the subclavian artery on both sides. Remember, this is happening on both sides of the thyroid, on both sides of the carotid, on both sides of the subclavian. Now, as we move into our venous drainage, now this is 
a little bit more complex than the arterial supply so we'll kind of just keep it basic here the superior thyroid vein is going to drain the top half of the thyroid just like the superior thyroid artery supplied it the superior thyroid vein is going to drain it so all of those little venules are going to join together and they're going to merge to form the superior thyroid vein that vein is going to drain directly into our internal jugular vein, that main vein that travels down from our brain to our heart. We also have a middle thyroid vein, which is going to drain the middle aspect of the thyroid. Um, it's going to kind of come off of that thyroid at the bottom outside aspect of the tissue, inferior lateral aspect. And again, that's going to drain directly into the IJV. And then we have our inferior thyroid vein. This is going to join at the bottom inner, the inferior medial aspect. And it's going to drain instead of into the IJV, it's going to drain into the left brachiocephalic vein. Now, you're probably thinking, wait a minute, we just said on the right side, of the aortic arch, we have a right brachiocephalic, but on the left side, we have the left jugular, I mean, excuse me, the left carotid and the left plebeian. We like, why did we all of a sudden get a left brachiocephalic? The venous system is a little bit different, okay? The aortic arch, first branch, right brachiocephalic, right brachiocephalic branches into the right common carotid and the right subclavian artery. Second branch off of the aortic arch is going to be the left common carotid artery. And the third branch off of the aortic arch is going to be the left subclavian artery. The venous system does not follow that. Remember, venous is draining back into the heart. Okay, so it's less pressure, it's less velocity of this blood supply. So it can kind of travel a little bit easier to get where it needs to go. The arterial system is a high pressure system. So it's going to be a little bit more rigid and particular. Don't ask me why the body develops the way that it does. I don't know the answer. So with our venous drainage, we do have a right brachiocephalic vein and a left brachiocephalic vein, okay? We don't have common carotid, artery, uh, common carotid veins. We don't. We only have internal jugular veins. So that's probably why we kind of get away with having these two different pathways in terms of the venous system being different from the arterial system. So if we look at our diagram here, we know our IJV is draining our brain and traveling down our neck to dump back into our heart. So we have this superior thyroid vein, middle thyroid vein, and inferior thyroid vein. And you can pretty much piece together where those veins are going to be located, right? Our superior vein is going to drain that superior half right into the IJV. The middle thyroid vein, we said it comes off kind of inferior lateral. It's going to drain right into the IJV. Now, the inferior thyroid veins, because they're draining from the true inferior medial aspect, it wouldn't make sense for them to drain like this. Would it? No, you would just keep draining down. You're going to use gravity to help you, and it's going to drain right into that left brachiocephalic vein. Both of them are going to drain into the left brachiocephalic vein. Again, that right side isn't going to go like this, right? It's going to go straight down, and straight down from the inferior medial thyroid is going to be our left brachiocephalic vein. Moving into our physiology of the thyroid and the parathyroid. The thyroid itself is an endocrine gland, and we should remember from last semester that endocrine glands are responsible for secreting hormones directly into the bloodstream. Now, the thyroid has a very close relationship with the pituitary gland in our brain and the hypothalamus in our brain. So we have a very close hormonal relationship with these structures. Now, the thyroid itself is going to be responsible for for producing and secreting these three hormones. We have thyroxine, that is going to be responsible for our overall metabolism, right? How fast is our metabolism or how slow is our metabolism? We also have triothyronine. This is going to have that same function, okay? Our overall body's metabolic rate. 
and it also is going to secrete calcitonin. This is saying how well does our body metabolize calcium? A weird little side note here. A lot of times we have patients come in for chronic kidney stones and we end up checking their thyroid. If you are producing kidney stone after kidney stone after kidney stone, while well, kidney stones are made of calcium, the majority of them are made of calcium, then you may have a problem metabolizing and breaking down calcium in your body. So we need to check that thyroid because the thyroid is responsible for that calcium metabolism. Now, we also know that our thyroid is going to be controlled by our TSH, our thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, this is going to help us control our hormone secretion, and it's also going to be controlled by the pituitary gland. So the thyroid isn't producing TSH, right? It's responding to TSH because it's being produced by the pituitary gland. So our pituitary gland is secreting and controlling how much thyroid stimulating hormone we have. And then our thyroid is picking up on that hormone to then secrete those three previous hormones, the thyroxine, the triothyronine, and the calcitonin. Now we also have thyrotropin releasing hormone, TRH, this is going to be secreted and controlled by the hypothalamus. This is also going to help us to secrete and regulate the TSH. So let's piece that all together. We have our hypothalamus, which is secreting and controlling the amount of thyrotropin releasing hormone. Now thyrotropin releasing hormone is going to say, hey, you can now secrete thyroid stimulating hormone to the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is going to talk to the pituitary gland. They're both going to figure out how much they can release of this hormone. And then that is going to be picked up by the thyroid and tell the thyroid what to do in terms of completing its endocrine functions. So if we look at our diagram to the side, we have our hypothalamus in our brain, our posterior brain, right here. And then a small, small little component coming off of that hypothalamus is going to be our pituitary gland. So this tiny, 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 tiny little gland right here is going to be responsible for quite a bit, right? It's not only responsible for secreting these hormones, but it's affecting how the thyroid is going to do its job. So if we have anything off between the relationship of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, or the thyroid, that's when we're gonna get a lot of these thyroid conditions that we're gonna talk about in our next PowerPoint. So we kind of just talked about this in a sense, but let's kind of just rework basically the function of the thyroid here. We have thyroid follicular cells are going to be the only cells that absorb iodine. Now, iodine is necessary and crucial for our well-being. The mechanism for producing thyroid hormones is going to be through that iodine metabolism. So if we have not enough iodine in our body, that could potentially throw off that relationship between the hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and thyroid. Now, the hypothalamus is going to produce that thyrotropin-releasing hormone, so it's going to say to the pituitary gland, hey, you can go ahead and secrete TSH, thyroid-stimulating hormone. Now, our low thyroid hormones are going to result in a decrease in our overall metabolic rate, which could result in an increase in thyrotropin-releasing hormone, which could also end up or result in an increase in that TSH secretion. And therefore we have an overall increase in our thyroid hormones. So if we have any type of disturbance between these major structures, or we have one hormonal level that's a little bit higher or a little bit lower than it should be, that is going to kind of mess up this whole process, this whole metabolic process. Now, when we have thyroid hormones return to normal and our metabolism is going to return to normal, then our TSH will stop. So basically our body is constantly saying, 
Do I have enough of this? If not, okay, let's start the process of upping that hormone. So say we have, let's go back to our third bullet point here. We have a low level of thyroid hormones. That means our metabolism, our body's metabolism is going to slow way down. When that metabolism slows way down, that is going to trigger our hypothalamus to produce TRH. Now, when we have that TRH, the pituitary gland is going to pick up on it and say, okay, well, the hypothalamus just released this hormone, this releasing hormone. Now I need to secrete my thyroid stimulating hormone. It's kind of like a relay, right? When you pass the baton to someone else. So you have your hypothalamus having an increase in this releasing hormone. The pituitary gland is picking up on those levels of that releasing hormone. So now the pituitary gland is saying, okay, I'm going to release my thyroid stimulating hormone right? This hormone is going to go off to stimulate the thyroid. And then that is going to result in that increase in thyroid hormones because the thyroid picked up on the thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. And now our levels are back to normal. Now, once our metabolic rate is back to normal, whatever that may be for that patient, that thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland is going to stop. So hopefully that kind of all pieces it together a little bit more. We do have some laboratory testing that we need to be aware of, particularly uh, in terms of indications for a thyroid ultrasound. We are looking mainly, so when a patient comes to us and there is a requisition that says, um, you know, patient with hyperthyroidism or hypothyroidism, it's like, okay, well, how, how do we know that? What are, what are we looking for? How do we know that that's something that could be affecting this patient, mainly by serum tests, by blood tests. So when we have a patient that comes in with certain clinical symptoms, they're tired, they're cold, or they're hot, can't sleep, they have these different hormonal imbalance symptoms, we're going to run that serum blood test to evaluate those different thyroid hormonal levels. So we can test for that TSH, that thyroid stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. And then we can also test for those other three endocrine hormones that are going to be produced by the thyroid. We also can do a nuclear medicine test, uh, which is not usually the first step in terms of diagnosis. Um, it usually will take the serum test, a thyroid ultrasound um, to, you know, kind of get this ordered for a patient, but we can do skin to skin to skin to, I can never say this word. <laughs> yeah. Nuclear medicine tests. When we do breasts, we learn about skin to mammography and I can say that word but for some reason I can't say skin to, skin to, skin to graphy, skin to graphy. I don't know. That's just, that word bothers me every time. <laughs> okay. Ignore that. Um, but basically it's a functional nuclear medicine test. And what we do is we test for the iodine uh, metabolism in these patients. So they get an injection um, and we see how they process iodine in terms of their thyroid functions. So we kind of mess up those patients' hormonal levels to see if their hypothalamus, pituitary, and thyroid can all compensate for that. So let's move into our ultrasound appearance of the thyroid. We typically want to see a thyroid that's nice and homogeneous with mid-level echogenicity or mid-level grays. We want to see uh, echogenicity in comparing it to the surrounding musculature. So we know muscles are a lot more dense than soft tissue. So the muscles, the muscles, the muscles surrounding the thyroid are going to be much more hypoechoic and striated. We also want to see symmetric lobe size. So we want to see the right lobe and the left lobe kind of coming in at the same measurements. Um, and we also want to see a symmetric appearance and vascularity throughout the entire gland. So we want to see when we put color on our tissue, we want to see that we're getting the same signal in both lobes. We don't want to see the right lobe lighting up like a Christmas tree and then nothing in the left lobe. So that would lead us to believe that there, there's something abnormal going on in one of those lobes. So here we have a really great picture of a transverse midline thyroid. We see the transverse view of the right lobe and the left lobe connected by our bridge, our isthmus right at the top, IS there. And then we see our trachea right in the middle, right posterior to that thyroid. Our trachea is going to be an air-filled structure 
right? Because that's how we breathe. So we are going to get all of this shadowing, okay? Remember, air is not our friend. It's going to kind of act like a gas pocket, but a little bit more contained. And then we also have our sternocleidomastoid muscles along the anterior lateral aspect. And less commonly seen are going to be our strap muscles. Also have our carotid and our jugular vein. Again, carotid, jugular. Remember our veins are kind of a little bit different shaped. If we look at our IVC compared to our aorta, our aorta is much more rigid, much straighter, doesn't really change in size at all with patients breathing, pulsates. That's going to be the same difference between the carotid and the jugular. Next, we have some indications for why we would be performing a thyroid ultrasound. Well, anytime, obviously, we have abnormal lab values, so that serum test comes back abnormal. Also, if the patient has any weight control complications, so for some reason they can't gain weight or they can't lose weight no matter what they're trying, that could be a hormonal imbalance. Anytime the patient feels any type of palpable lump on their neck, palpable means something that you can feel. If they have an asymmetry or swelling, either on one side or both sides of their neck. If they have dysphagia, so this means trouble swallowing, that could be an indication. There could be a mass in the thyroid that's closing that esophagus. We also are looking at these for anyone who has a family history of thyroid disease or cancer. And if for some reason our patient has had their thyroid removed, particularly for cancer reasons, we want to be doing a post-thyroidectomy FASA scan, making sure that none of that thyroid tissue grew back. The thyroid is a very functional structure. Those cells are very functional. So those cells want to proliferate. We very commonly see thyroid tissue grow back after a thyroidectomy. So we don't want to be surprised if the patient says to us, I had my thyroid removed, and then we do a post-thyroidectomy scan, and we see some thyroid tissue still there. Regeneration is very common for thyroid tissue and thyroid cells. And this also, I'm going back here for a second, this is a massive, massive, massive palpable lump. We usually are not seeing or feeling anything that large. Um, so this is a very dramatic and drastic uh, type of clinical image. Next, we have our exam. So what does our exam look like when we are performing a thyroid? Well, we want our patient laying down and we want their neck hyperextended. So if we look at our picture on the left side, that patient's neck is all the way up, right? Giving us a ton of room to work and navigate that transducer. Now the picture on the right side, look at the transducer. First of all, we're not really working with proper ergonomics, but her neck is so compressed, her head is not hyperextended, and look, we're losing contact with the skin here. So this is not going to help us. She needs to put her chin all the way back in order for us to manipulate and move that transducer how we need to. So we need that head and neck hyperextended, and we also want our patient to be turning their chin away from us or towards us, depending on which lobe we're looking at. So if you are a patient right now, go ahead and lift your chin up. If we are looking on the right side, if we're looking at our right lobe, we want that patient to turn their chin to the left, turn it away from us. That way we have more room to work on that right side. Now, when we go over to the left side to evaluate, we want to turn that chin towards us, towards the right side, giving us more room to manipulate our transducer on the left. We're also using a high frequency transducer. So this is the first time you guys are going to be working with that linear high frequency probe. And we're gonna learn all about that in physics, but we're using a 12 megahertz linear array transducer. So that's going to be our superficial soft tissue transducer. Here we have our protocol. This is also posted on Blackboard. We're starting in transverse with our midline pictures. We wanna put color on that butterfly uh, thyroid. We wanna evaluate the bridge, the isthmus. We're gonna do an AP measurement with that. We are also looking 
not only transversely at the right and left lobe, superior to inferior, but we're also looking at the submandibular glands on both sides. And I do have pictures of what that looks like in a few slides. But the submandibular gland it's going to be located directly under the patient's chin. When we say mandibular, we're talking about the mandible, and that's that bone in our chin or our bottom jaw is our mandible. So submandibular, we're going right underneath there. Uh, and we're putting color on that as well. We sometimes can get lymph nodes up there. We can get these masses that occur up there. So we just want to make sure that we are going all the way up underneath the patient's chin to give this patient a very full evaluation. We're not just looking at the thyroid. Yes, the thyroid is our focus, but we want to pay attention to these surrounding structures as well. So sagittal, we're doing our length, we're doing our measurements, we're putting color, we're doing medial, lateral, transverse, we're doing upper, mid, lower. When we say LP and UP, this means upper pole and lower pole. Upper pole just means uh, the superior aspect of tissue and lower pole means inferior aspect of tissue. Typically are only using upper pole, mid pole, and lower pole for transverse images and organs. Here we have our beautiful pictures of our thyroid. So we have our transverse here. Now we already kind of showed our transverse midline. We have these two bottom pictures here. That's exactly what we should be going for when we're looking for those transverse midline pictures. We see our right lobe, our left lobe, and our isthmus. We're putting color on all of that tissue. Um, and same thing to the picture on the right side. Now, when we're looking at our sag and transverse thyroid, this is what we want for our sagittal. And this is what we want for our transverse. And then that's isthmus right there. Okay, and here we have our submandibular pictures. So now look at our body marker with these pictures. Right here, oops, my little pencil went away. Right here is a body marker. So this is saying, Here's my transducer in relationship to this patient's anatomy. Look how superior they are. Now this, this body marker is showing a patient with their neck all the way hyperextended. That little curved line on the inside is almost like we're looking at their chin being extended all the way up. And we can see that line there, that transverse line is our transducer. And we are all the way up there to the right side. That's going to be our transverse submandibular gland here. And as we elongate that, or we turn our transducer sagittal, we have our sagittal right submandibular gland. Same thing on the left side. Oops, right there. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time practicing thyroids um, as well. It's a very fine-tuned type of hand manipulation going from sag, excuse me, going from transverse to sag in both the thyroid and the submandibular gland. So with the thyroid, there's a lot of pathology that occurs and how we measure these findings are really important and really particular, and we actually give them a grade, and we use a what's called a TRADS grading system, and we'll talk about that in a second as well. But we have to be very precise with our measurements. When we find something, we have to document it in two planes, so in transverse and sagittal, and we have to provide three measurements. We also need to put color on every single finding. So when we have nodules in the thyroid, we're going to learn all about them in our pathology lecture. But when we have nodules, they're going to be measured uh, as width and height in transverse and length in sagittal. So it's kind of opposite of what we've learned so far. We've said up until this point that sagittal is going to be your length and your height and your transverse is going to be your width. Well, when we're doing thyroids, for some reason, we like to do our length in sagittal, that's still the same, and our height and width in transverse. 
So this is really important for that TRADS grading, which we're going to talk about in a second. This is also kind of a new way of doing things. You may see some old school techs who are still measuring two measurements in sagittal, one measurement in transverse. But if they're using a TRADS grading system, they really need to be doing a length in sagittal and the height and width in trans. So here is our TRADS grading system. This stands for Thyroid Imaging Reporting and Data System. We also have something similar to this in the breast world. We have BIRADS grading. So TRADS grading is going to be a new reporting guideline system that is used by radiologists to help us get more of a clear diagnosis and treatment plan depending on these findings. So the ACR, the American College of Radiology, actually implemented this system after lots and lots of research on all of these thyroid uh, pathologies and nodules that we've been seeing. So it's a way to grade these nodules based on a certain criteria. So we're looking at the composition of the nodule, we're looking at the echogenicity of it, we're looking at the shape, the margins, if there are any echogenic foci in there, little punctate hyperechoic echogenic foci, any significant change in size from a previous scan. Typically when a patient has thyroid nodules, they come in once a year for an ultrasound. Um, we also want to say if there's any change in the features of the nodule um, or if there's a change in any of the ACR risk categories. So if we're changing, if we're falling into a new TRADS category um, than we did the year prior with that patient, then that's going to be kind of worrisome. So what does this actually look like? So here we have our chart. Now, as we said, we're grading them on composition, echogenicity, shape, margins or borders, and if there is any echogenic foci. So basically, if you are scoring zero to two points, you're not really, we're not worried about this nodule, right? Anything that is cystic, anechoic, wider than tall, smooth, no echogenic foci, that's going to be all normal, benign looking nodules. Now, if we see something that looks solid, hypoechoic, taller than wide, right, lobulated, um, punctate echogenic foci inside, you are scoring, you know, everything that I just said was two, five, eight, 11, 14, right? That would be 14 points. So that means that that is highly suspicious for being malignant or being cancerous. So it's just a way to kind of help streamline these uh, nodules that we're seeing. We see so many thyroid nodules out in the world um, that sometimes it can just get a little bit crazy. So we're really kind of grading the nodules on the characteristics of it. And then we are using this guide to help us determine what we should do, right? Do we need to do an FNA? An FNA stands for fine needle aspiration. That's where we go in and shake some cells loose with a needle and we suck them up into the needle and send them out for testing. Uh, and that would tell us if it is malignant or not. Um, so it's just a, a really streamlined way to kind of keep treatment in uh, diagnosis diagnosis consistent uh, throughout the country. Moving into our parathyroid here, so just finishing up, we only have a few slides left on this PowerPoint. We talked about these very briefly, but they are also an endocrine organ that's located posterior to the thyroid gland itself. We typically are going to have two pairs of oval-shaped glands, so we have four total. We have two on the inferior aspect of the posterior thyroid and two on the superior aspect of the posterior thyroid. We typically are not seeing parathyroid glands on an ultrasound unless they are enlarged, so if you do see something in this region, that looks slightly abnormal, that could be an enlarged or abnormal parathyroid gland. So what is the purpose of them? They help us to maintain proper and even levels of calcium in the blood. We also have a parath... parath I'm having a rough time with these hormones today. Parathormone is a, just a weird word. Uh, but basically when our calcium levels are low, the parathyroid glands are going to be triggered to produce this PTH, also known as parathyroid hormone or parathrin. It's going to be secreted by those parathyroid glands to help us perform that calcium uh, metabolism. 
And if we happen to do see parathyroid glands, one or multiple, we want to be documenting them. So in sagittal, uh, we want to be evaluating you know, obviously the posterior aspect of the thyroid, but we're looking at the superior region and the inferior region. Uh, same thing in transverse. We want to be looking uh, in that posterior aspect as well. So basically, if you see anything that looks like these images to the right, that is going to trigger us to say, hey, it's probably a parathyroid. Maybe there's something abnormal happening with it, or maybe it's just a little enlarged. The reason why you can tell that this is a parathyroid hormone and not a nodule is you can see the border of the thyroid tissue here. So you can see the separation between the parathyroid and the thyroid. If it were a nodule, if it were a thyroid nodule, we would not see that hyperechoic border or separation or interface between those two structures. Same thing up here. We have this here. Now, I do want to go back a few slides and show you guys what the esophagus will look like. I'm not sure if this picture is going to have it, so just bear with me. Um, no. Hold on. Hold, please. If not, I will just post. Oh, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to erase all my drawings here or most of them here. Okay, so our esophagus is going to be posterior to the trachea, but slightly to the left side. And we can oftentimes mistake that for a nodule or for pathology or even for a parathyroid. So this is going to be our esophagus right here. Okay, it will probably be a lot more obvious to you guys to see it once we start scanning each other in lab. Um, but just to know textbook wise and academic wise that the esophagus is very easily mistaken for pathology. It sits posterior uh, to the trachea and slightly to the left side. So just keep that in mind as well. So that is it for this PowerPoint. We are now going to move into our thyroid pathology.